Hello, I'm Lisa Hocker, Director of the Nuffield Family Justice Observatory. Welcome to this webinar on young people in care proceedings. It's the fourth webinar in a series brought to you by the Nuffield Family Justice Observatory and the Judicial College. Over the last year, Nuffield Family Justice Observatory has been working on a project on young people, encompassing those in care proceedings and in care, and those receiving support from children's social care. We've been bringing together existing and emerging evidence and insights from young people and professionals. We recognise the need to bring about change in the way the family justice system responds to young people's needs and to identify ways to improve support for young people across the family justice system and in its intersections with the care and youth justice systems. There is a real opportunity to rethink. With others, we are working to explore what is working well, what needs to change and what is needed for that change to happen. Over the next 90 minutes, we'll be presenting a range of new Nuffield fam uh, Family Justice Observatory research that aims to understand the reasons why older children and young people enter care proceedings. We'll also hear from professionals and from young people with experience of the care system. And we'll be sharing examples of innovative practice that aims to better meet the needs of young people. But first, here's an introduction to the session from Sir James Mumby, Chair of the Nuffield Family Justice Observatory. Welcome to this Nuffield Family Justice Observatory webinar series for the Judicial College. The Nuffield Family Justice Observatory was established by the Nuffield Foundation in 2019 to improve the lives of children and their families by putting data and evidence at the heart of the family justice system. All the people who work within the family justice system, judges, lawyers, social workers, CAFCAS guardians, policymakers, and more, share a common goal, helping children and their families to thrive in the future. But understanding how to achieve that ambition is limited by a lack of readily available data and research evidence and too few opportunities exist for those involved to share their knowledge and experiences. The observatory exists to find and fill the gaps in our understanding of the family justice system, to highlight the areas where change will have the biggest impact, and to foster collaboration to make that change happen. The centre of its lens is on the family courts, but its focus extends far beyond this. To understand the support that children and families need before they reach family courts and what happens after they've been through the family justice system. It is entirely independent, working with leading academics, reviewing evidence from around the world and commissioning new research where it is needed. During the pandemic, it has swiftly turned its lens on the impact of COVID-19 on the family justice system. Hearing from those experiencing the issues firsthand, not just professionals, but also importantly families, and identifying the opportunities and challenges abrupt changes to practice have offered up. Throughout this series, you will hear from a range of experts and others with experience of the family justice system on a range of issues, from the immediate impact of COVID-19 on hearings in the family court, to how best to manage contact between children in care or adopted and their birth families and more. As a family judge, I need no persuasion of the importance of the Judicial College. In my new role with the Observatory, I have rapidly come to appreciate not only the importance of research, but also just how valuable it is in illuminating much of this obscure in the working of the family justice system and in enabling us to see how things can be improved. I hope that this webinar series will be the beginning of a long and fruitful collaboration between the College and the Observatory. Thank you, Sir James Mumby. I'm pleased to say that later we will be joined by Sir Andrew McFarlane, President of the Family Division, who will give us his reflections on the findings that we are sharing today. So let's start with an overview of young people in care proceedings. The number of 10 to 17 year olds subject to care proceedings has almost doubled in the last 10 years, rising faster than for any other group. Older children now make up around a quarter of all children in care proceedings. Many older children have faced long-term neglect or instability and come from families with continuing domestic abuse, 
substance misuse or mental health problems and who are managing the impact of poverty on everyday life. Their early experiences of instability, loss and trauma mean they are more likely to exhibit challenging behaviours and be vulnerable to risk in adolescence. Extrafamilial risks from outside the home, such as criminal or sexual exploitation, rarely happen in isolation. Children with long-standing intrafamilial issues at home are more likely to face such risks. This raises questions about whether earlier support could prevent problems escalating. We don't know enough about young people's long-term outcomes after a care order is made. However, research does highlight a lack of placements offering the right care. This means that some of our most vulnerable older children and young people are likely to be living far from home in unsuitable places. Children's services, youth justice and CAMS are often all involved in their lives, but there is a lack of joined up care designed around their needs. Nuffield Family Justice Observatory is working with young people and professionals to identify what needs to change and how to make that change happen. Before we move on to the presentations, I'd like to say a few words about the format of today's event. There are several hundred of you attending, and while we won't be able to see you during the event, we do want to hear from you. So please share your experiences in the chat tab. We'll also be putting questions to our discussion panel during the last half hour of the webinar. So please put any questions you'd like to raise in the Q&A tab. All the comments and the questions will be read by the Nuffield Family Justice Observatory team to help shape future research and webinars. We are recording today's event and it will be available via the Judicial College and our own website if you'd like to revisit any of the content. I'm now going to hand over to Alice Rowe, researcher at the Nuffield Family Justice Observatory, who's going to talk about two new pieces of research which provide the first national overview of older children and young people in care proceedings in England and Wales, including new research which explores their health service use in Wales. So I'm going to talk about two pieces of research that we've done using CAFCAS and CAFCAS Cymru data to build a population level picture of young people in care proceedings in England and Wales. So we know from other data sources that there has been an increase in the number of older children entering care proceedings and coming into the care system. But we looked at the CAFCAS data in order to build a more detailed picture about who these young people are, where in the country they are living, and what the outcomes are from their proceedings. So what did we do? In the first study that I'm going to talk about, we use administrative data routinely collected by CAFCAS and CAFCAS Cymru to look at population trends in the number of young people in care proceedings and case outcomes. An anonymized version of the CAFCAS data is available for research purposes held in the privacy protecting SAIL data bank. So we looked at all cases involving 10 to 17 year olds who were subject to Section 31 care proceedings between the 1st of April 2011 and the 31st of March 2020 in England and Wales. We carried out primarily descriptive analyses to quantify case volumes, to look at the proportions of young people compared to all children in proceedings and to calculate incidence rates over time. So in this research and in all the research that you'll hear about today, we define older children and young people as those aged between 10 and 17 years old. This broadly reflects scientific consensus that the period of adolescence begins at around 10 years of age and legal definitions of children in the Children Act as those under 18 years of age. So before I share some of the findings from this work, it's worth bearing in mind a couple of limitations to using CAFCAS data for research. First, and this is particularly relevant for older children in care, CAFCAS data does not include children who come into care under voluntary Section 20 or Section 76 arrangements in England and Wales. We know that the majority of teenagers who do come into care do so under these arrangements. So it's important to stress that this research focuses only on those children who come into care through care proceedings 
and through the family courts. Second, the Kafkas data holds very limited information about children's ethnicity. This is a key limitation, as we know that there are disproportionate numbers of black and other ethnic minority groups in care, and that there may be stark differences about their journeys into and outcomes after proceedings that it's important for the family justice system to consider. Improving this data is a key aim of the FGO, and we're hopeful that through data linkage, we can start to build a better picture of the ethnicity of children and families in the family justice system. And finally, the Kafka data does not record child placement information alongside final legal order. So while we can say what the legal outcome was from a case, we don't know exactly where the child ended up living. So bearing all that in mind, I'm now going to provide a brief overview of the main findings from this work. But I do encourage you to take a look at the main report available on our website for more detail of the analysis. So first we calculated incidence rates of the number of young people in care proceedings per 10,000 adolescents in the population. So this tells us if the number of young people in care proceedings is increasing relative to the general population. So we can see that there has been a sharp increase in the last 10 years meaning that young people are now more likely to be subject to care proceedings than they were 10 years ago. This increase is noticeable in both England and Wales, and the rate of increase has been broadly similar in both nations. So you can see from the graph here that there was a particularly sharp increase around 2014-15 and 2016-17. It's of note that this coincided with changes in practice in relation to voluntary Section 20 and Section 76 arrangements and a likely increase in the number of these cases coming to court. We know from children's social care data that there was a decrease in the number of children coming into care under these arrangements around this time. So this may be one driving factor in the increase in the number of young people in care proceedings. But we can also see that even prior to this change, the rate of adolescents in proceedings was increasing. So next, we looked at the number of adolescents as a proportion of all children in care proceedings. So in England in 2012, 10 to 17 year olds made up less than a fifth of all children in care proceedings. By 2020, this had increased 27% over a quarter. This represents a significant shift in the age range of children appearing before the family courts. We also noticed a sharp increase in the number of 15 and 16 year olds who were subject to care proceedings that had increased substantially over this time. There was an increase of almost 150% in the number of 15 year olds in proceedings and an increase of over 250% among 16 year olds. There is a need for further research in order to understand the reasons why older adolescents are being brought into care proceedings in increasing numbers. So when we look at Wales, we see a similar picture. In 2011-12, adolescents constituted just 18% of all children in care proceedings. By 2019-20, this had increased to 23%. So young people now make up just under a quarter of all children in care proceedings in Wales, which is a slightly lower proportion than we see in England. So we also looked at regional differences in the number of young people coming into proceedings and while all regions have seen an increase over the last 10 years, the rate of increase has not been the same across the country. We can see that the Northeast in particular has a higher incident rate over time, which is the dark blue line in the graph. And this divergence becomes particularly apparent since 2015. The Northwest, Yorkshire and the Humber and London also have slightly higher than average rates, while the Southeast and East of England have one of the lowest rates. So the reasons behind this variation and the higher rates in the Northeast are not clear from the data and warrant further investigation with local stakeholders to explore. We know that the Northeast also has the highest rates for all children in care proceedings and that deprivation may be a key factor in this. The Northeast has had the biggest increase in child poverty rates between 2015 and 2020 out of all regions in the UK. And we also know that the Northeast has one of the lowest proportions of all children who are looked after on Section 20 arrangements, which may explain in part why we see higher rates of care proceedings in the region. So overall, we can't say from the data what drives higher rates in one area 
or lower rates in another. But it's important in order to better understand children and families' experience of the family justice system that we explore this further with local stakeholders. So in Wales, we explored local area variation by looking at the three district family judge areas. At the beginning of the study period, all three areas recorded fairly similar incidence rates, but from this point onwards, we can see some divergence. So rates began to increase in Cardiff and South East Wales and in North Wales, while in Swansea and South West Wales, the rate of increase has been much slower with fairly minimal change over time. So we also looked at some characteristics of the cases, including who young people were being brought into proceedings with. And we found that the majority of young people, just over 70%, were brought into proceedings with siblings. This is a slightly higher proportion than for children of all ages. In terms of the gender distribution, there was an approximately even split of boys and girls, which reflects a similar pattern to that which we see for all children in care proceedings. So finally, we looked at final legal order outcomes that were recorded in the CAFCAS data. The most common outcome at the close of proceedings for young people was the care order, and this occurred in around 60% of cases in England and 80% of cases in Wales. This has been relatively consistent over time. And as I mentioned earlier, we can't say from the data exactly where these children were placed under a care order, be that in foster care, residential care, at home or with family members. In England, we also found that there has been a notable increase in the number of younger adolescents to those aged 10 to 14 years who were placed with family members, rising from 16 to 23% over the study period. We know relatively little about the journeys of young people into kinship care or what their outcomes are, so this will be an important area for further research. We also found that in England, older adolescents, so those aged 15 and above, were slightly less likely to receive a care order. In particular, around a third of 16 and 17 year olds their, for their case resulted in no order or the case being withdrawn. And while there may be various explanations for this, including them aging out of proceedings, it raises questions about the grounds for bringing older adolescents into care proceedings and the capacity of the family justice system and the final legal orders available to meet their needs. So the second study that I'm going to talk about, which was conducted by the Family Justice Data Partnership, looked at the health of young people in care proceedings in Wales. By linking Welsh health data to Kafka's Cymru data in the SAIL data bank, we've been able to provide a descriptive overview of the health and health service use of young people in the year prior to care proceedings being issued. So this was compared to a comparison group of young people in the general population in Wales who were not involved in care proceedings and who were matched according to age, gender and area level deprivation. So to look at healthcare use, we explored the number of older children and young people who had at least one hospital admission, A&E or GP attendance during the year prior to proceedings. And as you can see from this figure, there is an overall picture of higher healthcare use for the cohort of young people in care proceedings compared to those in the general population. And we see this across healthcare services, including hospital admissions, A&E attendance, where over a third of the cohort had attended A&E in the year prior to proceedings, and for GP appointments, with almost all young people in the cohort having a record of a GP appointment. So next, the research team looked in more detail at the reasons for these visits and the health conditions that were recorded in the data. And they found relatively high prevalence of certain conditions among young people who were subject to care proceedings compared to those in the general population. It was particularly concerning that when looking at the GP data, over half of young people in proceedings had a diagnosed mental health condition compared to around a third in the general population. And this points to the mental health needs of this group of young people and further emphasises the need to ensure proper mental health support is available before, during and after care proceedings. So when looking at the reasons for hospital admissions, it was noticeable that the most common condition record recorded and where there was the largest difference compared to the comparison group was for injury and poisoning related conditions. Further work is needed to explore the nature of these conditions in more detail, including their causes, but this may include, for example, self-harm, accidents or assault. 
We also see a fairly big difference in hospital admissions for mental disorders. Although the overall number here is very small, with just under 2% of all young people in care proceedings being admitted to hospital for mental health reasons, it does suggest that this group of children are more likely to be admitted to hospital for their mental health compared to their peers. So finally, looking at the conditions recorded during A&E attendance, we see a similar picture of heightened health vulnerabilities in the cohort group compared to in the general population. The most common reason for A&E attendance was for wounds, and there was a particularly stark difference between the cohort and comparison group for poisoning or overdose-related conditions, which may relate to drug or alcohol misuse problems, and for attendance at A&E for mental health issues. So what does this tell us? By using national CAFCAS data, we've been able to look at the overall trends of young people coming into care proceedings. And we found that the number of 10 to 17 year olds in care proceeding has approximately doubled in the last 10 years. However, this increase is not being felt equally around the country. So further work is needed to better understand the drivers of this increase and the outcomes of young people in care proceedings, which should include hearing from young people themselves. By linking CAFCAS data to other administrative data sources, is one way that we can provide a better picture of and better understand the needs of young people who come into proceedings. So by linking to health data, we've been able to show that these young people have more health vulnerabilities, particularly around mental health, when over 50% had a diagnosed mental health condition and are more likely to be involved with both primary and secondary healthcare services compared to similar young people in the general population. By better understanding the health needs of young people in care proceedings, those involved in health services can work with children's social services and the youth justice system in order to better identify and support those at risk. Thank you. Thank you, Alice. We'd like to hear your thoughts on these findings. Don't forget to add your comments to the chat and put your questions in the Q&A tab. I can see that many of you are already doing so and we're really keen to hear from you. What is particularly striking from our work uh, on young people is that when speaking to judges, social workers, youth workers and other professionals, there's an almost universal sense that the options open to them don't fully meet the needs of young people. There's a sense of frustration that their contribution is too limited or the options available to them are too restricted. Young people's needs in some ways are very straightforward. For example, to have sustained trauma-informed support, strong relationships and a network of people, including their family, that stick with them through difficult times, and a voice over what is happening to them and the decisions being made about them. We've been talking to professionals about current problems with the family justice and child welfare systems. Let's hear from a, from a few of them now. We've actually got a group of young people and some of whom have experienced lots of early childhood adversity, might have a whole range of needs, have circumstances that need addressing. And yet as a group, we know very little about their needs. Many children are in stable placements, but there is a group who are moving and who have some of the worst outcomes. By their experiences of... Um seeing children who I'm aware of being in foster care, then seeing them appear in residential care, and then receiving papers to pursue an application for a secure accommodation order, for example. So this trajectory, um, this sort of sort of sad convey about where suddenly the system says there's there's nothing more to do, say for ask the court for authority to, you know, lock this child up for a period of time. When you're only intervening with young people starting to get involved, when they get to crisis point, because the focus becomes on the risk, what, what you end up with is then not paying enough attention to people's strengths, to their care, to their responsibilities. Minoritised children and young people, where are their voices and experiences being amplified and who's talking about the structural and systemic inequalities which continue to permeate throughout all of those various different systems. 
Safeguardings retain this almost uniquely binary, quite quaint idea that you can neatly um, delineate between childhood and adulthood, as if adolescence isn't the very process of transitioning from one state to the other. Uh, inherent in that is quite a binary notion of uh, victimhood and villainy. Treatment of children, I think, in the youth justice system is often conflicted. The children involved in the youth justice system have a dual status. They're both um, a child, um, but then they also have an, a, a status as an offender or a suspect. Um, so that can be in conflict. There is something about the increased professionalisation of social work, of youth justice work, which I think has tended to get in the way of, let's say, caring relationships. We need to ensure that professionalism allows for caring too. A cautionary message to all of us to be really careful uh, and not just assume that contact with family justice or youth justice or child welfare system is a good thing. Thank you to all those professionals for taking part and sharing their views. You can watch the full film on our website. Now let's hear from three young people with experience of the care system. In conversation with each other, they provide a valuable insight into life in care. But in terms of like support and stuff, I I felt supported by like my guardian. I think the one thing that I would say was she actually like listened to me. Like I could speak to her and I would tell her, I don't want this or I don't want this or I don't want um like some of the things like sometimes it would be a bit tough, like especially with my mum, so I might be like, Well, I I want this to be said, but I want it to be said in a way that doesn't make my mum look like like a crazy person. So sometimes I think the um, the way that like, she was really sensitive with the information that was given to her um, and the way that she responded to the information that was given, um, she was like, quite supportive and yeah, I felt heard. That was, I think that was the most important thing was that I actually felt heard. You are just like a case and you're one of thousands. It's like you're a number on a piece of paper that your feelings aren't really taken into account they just see the case and they see what needs to be done and what boxes need to be ticked you're no longer a person you're not even a number you're a piece of paper and i think that's the hardest part so i agree like it is very impersonal and i think sometimes like i know that there's like it's like power struggles between who like who do we listen to other parents the, the ones that we listen to or do we listen to the children because the parents are supposed to know better or the parents are the ones that make the decisions that benefit the child right yeah I, I get what you mean a lot of people's and children's voices are taken away when it comes to the court it's kind of like they're the adults they know best and really you're not even informed of the decisions till they're already made in my experience that like the law the lawyers that we had I don't even know. Well, the 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 one the last one that I remember, I just felt like he was not supportive of my mum at all. Like, and he was just basically like, "Yeah, just um, just just sign the papers. Don't don't um, object to anything. Just just do everything that they say. Like, just." And I was thinking at the time, I was just thinking, well, for me, I was just like, "That's the right thing to do." But when I think about it, it's like actually, no, like. I believe that you should be trying to help this woman to fight for her kids and even try to support her and help her realize what she needs to do. And, you know, like, obviously it's not, you might, I don't know what the lawyer's jobs are in that situation, but from a humanity point of view, if you can see that someone has needs or someone has, needs help and you're a person that is actually representing them, you would put those things out there, let, let, let people know that actually this isn't just someone that doesn't want to be a parent, this is someone that actually is having a difficult time at the moment and, you know, they don't really know how to navigate through this part of their life. And my mum didn't have that at all. Her lawyer was just like, yeah, just go to, just turned up at the court with his papers all over the place um, and just was like, yeah, just give up the kids. And it was, it was, 
for me at the time, I was like, yeah, because it just meant that my mum didn't have to go through um, like literally an actual fight. But at the same time, it was like, I felt like for my little sisters, later on in their life, they might feel like, well, my mum didn't even fight for me. Like she was just so willing to just be like, yeah, just let them have them. And it wasn't like that at all. It was more of a, right now we need, we need something. We need something right now. You'd start to explain something and the person that is said, the person that you're saying it to you builds an entire story based on that one sentence instead of actually waiting to hear how everything goes along. There's so much that they're not allowed to reveal and they're not allowed to say, especially within their personal circumstances, that they are not themselves when they are in their job. They're not themselves. The people that we're working with, if you get to know their age or if they're married or a little bits of information like that, that's better for you. But we don't get that information. We're sat with someone who has a whole case pa caseload in front of us. And we're barely even allowed to know their, 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 neat, their details, their simple information, because it's protective of them. And obviously it's understanding. Like it's understandable due to safeguarding and risk, and risk, ass risk assessment and all of that. But on a relational level, if you want me to relate to you and you want to connect with me, you need to give me something to relate to. You need to actually throw something out there that I could latch on to. Like, I want you to trust them, but they don't give you anything like to work with. Like, mm -hmm. it's very, well, I know everything about you, but you can't even know my middle name kind of thing. And it's kind of like, how do you ever expect to have a relationship with a young person or even a child? What I think they forget, and this isn't just social workers, foster carers, care homes, wherever you end up. I think they forget that they're effectively raising this person to go out into the world and have their own family, have a job. And they need to help them move past their traumas to be able to do that uh, it's a very big misunderstanding there's a very big misunderstanding between the professionals working with the families and especially the ones that have to relay the messages for the families and on behalf of the families because these people that are basically delivering this message they're carrying a very fragile piece of glass and most of these members of staff they just bump it into everything they knock it they change it they it's, oh, it don't matter it's nothing like and that is someone's life that's a future that is that is our future if a kid is telling you that mom i need to see you three times a week so that you can know who i am or five times a week and spend time with you parents be saying oh, i gotta work i gotta work okay but when that kid is now smashing up teachers at school because that kid is so angry at the world because they actually they don't get to spend any time with their parents and they actually want to be seen and heard. Like everyone acts like things don't make sense and no one is listening. We're letting people know that actually before you even go and look at the issues that children have, let's look at the parents. How do we support parents to be better parents? And I know that they will say, oh, well, they do this and we got this and we got that. They're not working. Clearly, the systems are not working. Whatever has been tried in the past is not working. And no one has stopped to think, actually, what, what are we doing wrong here? Like, why is this system not working? They just keep going. They just keep going. I just got to jump in and say, I don't think there should be a timeline. I think it should be, well, there shouldn't be a physical timeline as such. I think there should be a timeline based on needs. The basic needs aren't met. Like a lot of these young people who are leaving at 25 that still need the support, that could be prevented. Like if they actually provided the support and met the children's needs from day dot of them coming into the system, they'd already be prepared enough to then, even earlier than 25, go off. Instead of throwing you into the deep end, they should work with you from day dot coming into care. I mean, when I left, I'd never even heard of council tax, like, and all of a sudden you're supposed to just work life out. They just throw you into the deep end. There's no preparation. But me, with my own children, they would always be taught about the real world and the practicalities of life. Not just, oh, you're 18 now, go live on your own. You've turned 25, you can figure it out. It doesn't work like that. It's that cycle as I'm a prime example of that, or at least I like to think I am. 
Or there's the other cases where you see these care kids that have gone on actually to just do exactly the same because they were never taught a different way. And then they lose their kids and then their kids lose their... And it's just a vicious, never-ending cycle. Somewhere along the line, somebody's going to have to go enough's enough and make some changes because at the end of the day, it's not just this generation's lives that's been ruined by it. They're ruining many to come after. We are very grateful to Aikisha, Caitlin and Mike and the other young people we've been speaking to for sharing their experiences. If that prompts questions or comments, uh, please uh, put those uh, in the Q&A tab um, for us to put to our panel at the end of this webinar. We'll now take a look at some new research that aims to help us find out more about why older children and young people are in care proceedings. We begin with a case file review presented by Jordan Rehill, researcher at the Nuffield Family Justice Observatory. Following this, Celia Parker and Joe Tunnard, senior associates at Research and Practice, will present findings from an in-depth audit involving older children who were subject to care proceedings issued in four local authorities in England and Wales. This case file review, along with other work presented in the session, is part of the long-term focus of the Family Justice Observatory to understand sort of what is working well in supporting older children and young people, what needs to change, and what is needed for this change to happen. Before I begin, I'd just like to thank Her Honour Judge Carol Atkinson and Lindsay McHugh on behalf of the authors and the NFJO for their support and assistance in accessing the case files at the East London Family Court. So for this particular report, we reviewed applications for care proceedings relating to 73 older children and young people aged 10 to 17 received by the East London Family Court between July 2019 and July 2020. And by reviewing these C100A applications, which most of you will know will include information about the grounds for proceedings and also the age and gender of the children included in the application, what we really wanted to do was start building a more detailed and nuanced snapshot of what's going on in families' lives at the point care proceedings are issued. And with any sort of local study such as this, there are you know, a number of limitations. So number one, our study is limited by you know, its small sample, which consisted of cases in one core area across a one-year time frame. It's also limited by the information contained in the C100A application forms. And though these forms provide some valuable insights as to why these cases are being brought to court, they do not provide a complete overview of a family's history or their prior involvement with children's services, and nor do they contain information about the outcome of proceedings. That being said, the analysis of these forms allows us to draw out live, current um, needs of older children and young people, as well as their families, and reflect you know, some important um, findings identified in similar case reviews carried out in different local authorities across England and Wales. So what do we know about the young people and their families? So we know that almost all of the older children and young people in our sample have been known to children's services for several years before proceedings are issued, often since they were young children or infants. And often in a number of cases, there was evidence of chronic neglect that have been going on for much of the young person's life. As well as this, you know, we often saw the parents of these children had significant and long-standing vulnerabilities, including substance misuse, mental health problems, and domestic abuse. And this was often linked to the parents' own experiences of trauma and loss. And what we also saw is the young people in our sample had often experienced high levels of instability and loss and complex trauma from a young age. And we know that you know, from wider evidence that these experiences are highly likely to affect behaviors and vulnerability to risk in adolescence. Now turning to why proceedings were issued, what we saw was over half of the children and young people involved in proceedings in this period were involved with siblings. So in all but one case, the welfare concern was shared across sibling groups. So several cases were brought to court because of 
a breakdown of informal family care arrangements, often because carers struggle to manage more challenging behaviours in adolescence. What we also saw was the concerns around extrafamilial risk often co-occurred with or were underpinned by intrafamilial concerns. This included, as mentioned in the sort of previous slide, experiences of chronic neglect and abuse, complex trauma, instability and loss, which are you know, highly likely to affect challenging behaviours and vulnerability to risk in adolescence. So in terms of this extrafamilial risk or concerns, we saw the proceedings were often issued at a moment of crisis or when the risk of extrafamilial harm became too great. Um, and opportunities to intervene earlier may have been missed or have been or may have been unsuccessful. So in these cases, the young people were often facing multiple risk factors linked to criminal exploitation, gang or criminal group involvement, child sex, sexual exploitation, school exclusion, and behavioural and mental health difficulties, as well as issues of criminal behaviour. And I think the, the really important point to take away here is though. Though we're seeing proceedings you know, issued because of risks or harms from outside the home, these risks are nearly always preceded or were nearly always preceded by long-term concerns within the family. This extra familial harm does not exist in a vacuum. So this case file review should really be seen as one of the first steps, providing live current information to guide our thinking about why older children and young people are coming into proceedings. So I'll now hand over to Celia Parker and Joe Tunnard from Research and Practice, who will provide a sort of deeper dive into some of the issues I've discussed, thinking about the outcomes of proceedings, as well as young people's subsequent journeys. And they'll do this by drawing on the findings from their local authority case audit. Many thanks for your time. I'm going to tell you what we did and what we found. We prepared an audit questionnaire to consider the circumstances of children and families before, during and after care proceedings. Four local authorities, all with areas of high deprivation, three in England, North, South and London, and one in Wales, completed the audit from their records on children aged 10 and over where care proceedings were issued in 2019-20. We analysed the audits for a total of 73 children from 49 families. Very few of the children, just six, were single children. The rest had brothers and sisters, some in proceedings, some not in proceedings. Just over two thirds of the children were in the 11 to 13 age range. The majority of families were known to the local authorities, 82%, and 32 of the 49 families had been through all stages of support. Half the families had children in care already at the start of proceedings, and a third of the families were actually in repeat proceedings. The time between the proceedings varied from one to 12 years. The reasons for proceedings included 78% due to neglect, 49% due to domestic abuse, 43% physical harm and 10% sexual abuse in combinations. And this gave rise to 100% emotional harm for those children. The issues affecting parenting capacity were almost a third with substance misuse, almost half with cumulative trauma and just over a third with poor mental health, again in combinations of those three. Trauma was a major issue for the children and many of the parents. 25% of children were also affected by extrafamilial safeguarding concerns, criminal exploitation and sexual exploitation. This affected four boys and four girls. One girl and one boy had spent time in psychiatric hospital as inpatients, one on a section. Just over half of the children ended proceedings on a care order. Mostly they were fostered and some were in kinship foster placements. Counting the kinship foster placements, 
just under a half remained at home or living within the family network at the conclusion of proceedings. We found that the most vulnerable children had had the most placement moves and a lack of suitable accommodation to meet their complex needs, secure and other types of accommodation was very evident. The most stable placements for this group were kinship placements. It was difficult to get a, a good picture of youth justice involvement, but youth offending teams were involved with 16%, that's 12 of the 73 children. We also noted nine families where the parents were involved in the criminal justice system. School exclusion was a clear factor for those with most vulnerability to um, extra familial safeguarding concerns. There were seven permanent exclusions and 11 short-term exclusions. We were surprised to find no mention of the Education Welfare Service beyond one prosecution for non-school attendance. The most striking thing in undertaking the analysis was the trauma affecting the children and the parents. And I'm now going to hand over to Joe to talk about our reflections and recommendations. We have five key points for today, arising from exploring with the local authority auditors and senior managers, this small piece of the huge jigsaw that is safeguarding work, both within families and beyond families. We hope that something chimes with some of your work in court as magistrates and judges and out of court as professionals in the local service network. First, we make a plea for renewed focus on early attention to parental needs. Children in the audit needed their parents to be well enough and to be well enough equipped to care for them safely. They needed parents to be helped with the struggles of life marked by poverty and disadvantage and with parenting made more difficult by substance misuse, domestic abuse, poor mental health and learning difficulties. The audit confirmed that effective help takes account of what parents want from services and of how they might respond when they feel under threat or in stress. Increasingly, we know about the value of trauma-informed practice and of help that is proactive and offered sooner rather than later. And the second point, is the importance of fostering strong and enduring relationships. Some children in the audit were clearly relieved to be in care, to feel less burdened by what they had been struggling with over a long and unhappy period for many of them. But we saw too how these older children were drawn back to the place that was home and to the people who were family. They wanted to stay in touch and they and their parents needed help to deal with the tensions, the emotions, the risks and the benefits of wanting to make things work better. The audit showed the value here of family group conferencing. This achieved something for children almost every time they were used, a positive move from one parent to the other, continuity while a plan was developed, long-term care from a godparent or a family friend, contact re-established with the lost side of the family. In the local authority that used FGCs the most, this was an embedded way of harnessing strengths within the family network. And crucially, the work was led and backed by policies and by strong leadership committed to a family inclusive approach. Third, we say something about better support needed when proceedings end with supervision order. As families adjust to the new way of being together, how can we offer the best possible chance of their adjusting well? How do we stop one in three cases coming back to court as repeat proceedings with the added heartbreak and sense of failure for all involved? Do we need to put more emphasis on the assistance, advice and befriending side whilst not forgetting the supervision side. Exploring in court and out of court, 
the practical and emotional help that each child, each parent might find helpful and finding ways of providing this for them. Fourth, a plea for sufficient, suitable residential provision for older children with complex difficulties who need help away from home. This is about local authorities having ready access to small, safe, local specialist children's homes, with children staying close to where they belong, help to deal with negative past experiences, get therapeutic help, make up for lost education, develop their talents, feel inspired and confident about the future. It's also about local authorities having access to secure accommodation when children need that for welfare reasons. And it's about knowing more about the experiences and outcomes the children held in the youth secure estate for offending reasons. And last for now, a point about the involvement of different partner agencies. We looked in the audit for collaborative work with education, health, youth justice. And we saw it too for a handful of families with a family court because two sites offered parents in care proceedings the FDAC approach with its specialist multi-agency and multidisciplinary team working closely with the trained FDAC judge. But we're going to end on a point about the universal service of education. So we saw how often school acts as a haven, a place of safety for children and a source of support for parents too. But we saw that absence from school can increase vulnerability to extrafamilial harm, especially when the absence coincides with the child being missing from home, hanging about with peers and others involved in risky behaviour. Our specific recommendation here is that any proposal to exclude a child from school must trigger a multi-agency response. A conference, we say, should be required to consider the risk of exclusion leading to or including, increasing extrafamilial harm and to examine the likely impact on the child of being rejected by their school. Because almost certainly, rejection from school will be coming on top of earlier rejection by one, some or many others in their life. So we say it cannot be right to punish children, punish their parents in this way. Well, there's plenty more in our report. You'll find there more details about the statistics that Celia covered. And you'll also find a selection of case studies that we hope will convey a strong sense of the human stories behind the stats, of the lived experience of these older children and their families, and of the challenges and achievements for everyone involved, families, and professionals alike. Thank you. Thank you, Jordan, Celia and Joe. So we know there are many problems and challenges, but let's now hear from professionals who are implementing innovative practice to address them. We're going to hear about projects in Coventry and Warwickshire and in Newport. The, um, the concern that I personally had was that um, um, social workers, uh, sometimes guardians, were saying to me uh, that young people, perhaps of 14 years, 15 years, that it was all too late uh, and that uh, nothing, uh, nothing could be done. Uh, they were lost in the system, lost in society. I didn't actually agree with that analysis. Uh, I realized that uh, if we're looking at teenagers of, of that sort of age, that time was limited, but I, I didn't see that we should write them off. Quite the opposite. I thought we should work with them and see whether some improvement could be made in the short time that we had available. And um, we decided that, that we would, um, um, adopt the practices that we had developed in Coventry, in Coventry, in the Family Drug and Alcohol Court. We call it FDAC, the Family Drug and Alcohol Court. And the key elements of FDAC are meetings with the judge, 
and the um, tailor-made focused uh, support, wraparound support for the, for the parents. Uh, so we already had that model up and running in Coventry. And we, um, we wondered whether we could um, adapt and um, uh, change that approach so that it would help young people in proceedings. The first key point is um, um, a document called My Plan. The My Plan questions are very simple. They, 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 they um, ask the question, uh, what, what, what do I want to happen in my life is one of the questions and why. Um, well, when the young person first fills in that form with the, um, with the, the social worker, um, he will say something like, I want to go home or I want these proceedings to come to an end. And um, as a judge, you're able to say, well, that's what the, uh, the family proceedings, the care proceedings are all about. And I will make a decision about that. But I'm interested in, in you. I'm interested in what you want um, to happen in your life. And uh, that's when the, uh, you can visibly see the young, young person's shoulders just going down. They're relaxing. And one young, um, young man said to me, um, I just want to go to school because I want to, um, I want to um, get on well with my education, but I can't get there. Um, my mum is busy with my younger sister and she doesn't have time to get me up and get me to school. Um, and I have to take two buses and I'm always late. Uh, and so um, um, he, he said to me that what I really want is a bike. If I had a bike, I could cycle to school and um, I, I would be on time. So we were able, uh, the judge, I, I was in fact the judge on that occasion, I was able to speak with the social worker and say, well, surely we can get him a secondhand bike and a helmet uh, and perhaps even get him to um, um, some um, um, road safety classes so he's safe on, on the roads. And we achieved that. Um, he got a bike. Uh, the, the, because it was an old bike, he kept on getting punctures. So, um, in fact, it was his dad who showed him how to uh, uh, change the tyres and to mend the punctures. Uh, so that, that was a, uh, something which he could do with his dad. And this young, young man um, arrived regularly at school on time. Um, so much so, uh, he told me in one of the adolescent project meetings with me that um, his um, teacher had uh, bought him a, a bacon cob for, um, uh, for being uh, um, arriving on, on time for school uh, for a whole um, half term, I think it was. So yeah, little things which can make such a difference to um, a young person. And in the end, um, it was an entirely successful outcome because that young person was able to stay at home. He was able to demonstrate a level of independence uh, and uh, um, it turned the case around. So, uh, Young people have, have shared more with their social workers after the meetings with the judges. What we've heard from social workers is that because they're taking the young people to those meetings and they're then taking them back to placement or to home afterwards, um, it's an opportunity to talk in the car and young people tend to speak during car journeys because there's nothing else to do. So, um, so they have opened up more about the meetings that they've had with the judges and it's had a positive impact on the relationship that they've had with their social workers. The, the other thing that we heard from solicitors was that they, they felt that the young people had become more confident in speaking to their solicitors and giving their own instruction. So whether they separated from their guardian or not, they were more confident in, in speaking to their solicitors and saying what they wanted their solicitors to say on their behalf which again is a really positive thing for young people to feel is that they feel that they can give those instructions to their solicitors and, and ask that their solicitors tell the court, their parents, professionals working with them, what their views are. And when we're looking at children that, or older children that come into the courts, they tend to have very complex needs. They tend to have um, a lot of um, anxieties, a lot of issues that result from their involvement with their families with the wider community in schools, social isolation, 
and having tools that enable them to better engage in their process, to better engage in the work that they're doing with professionals can only be a positive experience for them going forward. So Newport, as some will know, is a, a small city in southeast Wales. We have a particular demographic. We've got um, significantly higher numbers of children from all sorts of backgrounds than most other Welsh areas, so quite different. And I suppose the big challenge for us in relation to, um, to partly what I'm talking to you today was specifically around placements for older children. And those are placements that very much um, are those children who fall somehow um, between children's services, youth justice services and child and adolescent mental health services. Um, and we, like many local authorities, were seeing um, increasing numbers of children where provision and care for that, that group was really challenging for us to access. We're only at the beginning of this project. We haven't got to the end yet by a long, long way. So what we've been doing is working in partnership with our health board and Iron Bevan Health Board um, and the other four local authorities in our area to look at how we build a resource that can meet that need. Um, and, it, and it came about really because we and the other four local authorities in our area um, were repeatedly having crises, the only way to describe it, for children who were ending up in inappropriate care, so they were ending up potentially on a paediatric bed um, or in an unregulated placement and we were unable to meet their needs and we were unable to secure any sort of appropriate placement for them outside of the authority. Um, so the, the Change Project has been very much about um, building a resource that can meet that need and fill that gap. This is a partnership development for um, a provision called Windmill Farm. I have to say it's still very bumpy and really hard, um, but it's something that we're trying to do. What we've been trying to do is come together earlier to provide a joint provision um, where we're all engaged and we're all thinking in the same way to try to resolve the challenge that we have. We're trying to stop children being stuck in inappropriate placements without the right care. Simple as that, really. We were one of the local authorities that had the resources, the staff um, and the ability to provide a regional home for children, um, older teenagers with complex needs um, to prevent them going to secure homes or um, to help them come back into the community if they've been into secure or um, hospital settings. So it's still in the early stages. We haven't opened the home at the moment. I've got a number of other young people's um, children's homes within Newport. This it's different because this is with health so with our other homes the children would have to access health through waiting lists um, and referral processes and, and that can cause a lot of delay for these young people um, with windmill farm health are on board with this so the young people will access um, specialist cams or any of the services attachment and trauma services that they need um, once they're placed within this home so it's about joint working and that's not been done before it's one of the first ones within wales to look at this as a, as a project to see how we can work together i hope that there's be a reduction in the children having to go into secure units or into um, hospital beds i'm hoping that that when if young children young people have had to go into them that we can find appropriate this will be appropriate accommodation for them so they're not in um, unregistered or inappropriate accommodation that we there's a, so there's a reduction there's a better care that we, we've got um, more placements available um, and, and it's a home for these young people whilst we, we reduce their crisis it's really important that we, we drive this forward we need placements for young people appropriate ones within Wales within their regions thank you to those professionals for sharing those examples of innovative practice now, I'm delighted to say that we are joined by Sir Andrew McFarlane, President of the Family Division, to reflect on what he's heard so far. Good evening. Um, unlike most of the other contributors, I'm live, and I'm live from a hotel room in Jersey, so um, let's hope the line stays up. Uh, I've watched this material this evening uh, in exactly the same way uh, as you all have. I was not aware of it. Uh, before uh, an hour ago. So these are very much um, initial impressions. Uh, the first is gratitude and admiration for the Nuffield Family Justice Observatory for drawing all this together for us in the Judicial College and then delivering it in such an accessible and indeed very engaging 
way engaging in the sense that um, you want to hang on for more, particularly from the young people who spoke to us. Um, there's an enormous amount of data here and research here that's been uh, collected and then delivered to us in the course of uh, an hour. It's very rich and I'd encourage those of you who are interested in these uh, issues to look at the raw research that the various researchers have been talking about. It, in a way, none of us who are working in family justice should be surprised uh, by much of what we've heard. It is a picture of what we see uh, and um, to that extent uh, we should feel reassured. I suspect that wherever we are in the country um, it's in tune, sadly, awfully, with the needs of these young, older, young people who come before the court. But it's very, very useful to have it all brought together and laid out and to see that, yes, yes, there was a rise in the number of uh, young people in this group who come to the court uh, in child protection proceedings about seven or eight years ago, and that's been uh, sustained. Um, I took on board what one of the contributors said was that we shouldn't necessarily think it's a good thing um, for uh, people to be drawn into the criminal justice system or the family justice system. And, uh, and we are right to have that word of caution. But if they're going to be drawn into one or other, I'd rather they came to the family justice system if they're teenagers than into the criminal justice system. And I think part of the reason, only part of the rise, is that we're seeing quite a few youngsters who are involved in county lines or uh, other fringes of uh, crime and would probably have ended up in criminal justice some years ago, but are now rightly seen by social workers as victims and are being protected in the uh, family justice system. And that's right. Uh, also, um, there are those high number we saw uh, with mental health difficulties who might have gone or might have hoped to go uh, into child and adolescent mental health, but haven't for whatever reason, uh, and they come to us. And if they didn't come to us, where would they go? Maybe into the criminal justice system. So uh, uh, we need to look at the figures and not think it's necessarily a bad thing that greater numbers of these young people are now being noticed. They're now on our radar, on the social workers radar, and they're coming to us. Similar point, the figures in Wales were higher. Uh, and there is concern, uh, the First Minister of Wales particularly takes uh, interest in this as to why Wales is higher. But it's worth asking the question whether it is a good thing or a bad thing, a worrying thing or a sign of quality uh, that in social services in Wales and the courts in Wales are involving themselves and seeking to protect a greater number of young people. I don't know the answer to that, but the fact that England is lower doesn't necessarily mean that life is being lived in England in a different way uh, from Wales. It may be that the threshold for intervention uh, is uh, lower in Wales and more cases come. And is that a good thing or a bad thing? And that's, of course, an entirely blunt question and, and, the, and the wrong one. So the fact that numbers are coming in is interesting. The next stage is what we do in the proceedings. And here the voices of the young people um, were very telling. Uh, we need to know more uh, uh, about what it's like to be in the care process, uh, what we could do better uh, for the families, what their perspective is. Uh, equally, the contribution uh, from Judge Henry Watson in Coventry uh, about the uh, FDAC intervention and directly involving the young people <coughs> is, I think, inspirational uh, and one that we could all reflect on and, and see how we could um, develop that. It was dynamic, it seems, in terms of the relationship that the young people had with their social workers. What we do when they're in the proceedings is, of course, crucial. And then the next stage is what happens at the end of the proceedings. Do we make a care order or not? What, the, what is the care plan? Uh, and for some of these young people, they are extremely troubled. And the care plan, the placement, uh, is very tricky. We, we have an increasing number of young people who need to have their liberty restrained in some way, dolls, uh, in uh, various settings, not secure accommodation, but something that protects them, but nevertheless protects them from themselves by restricting their liberty. These are really tricky, really tricky cases, and but we need to learn that more about that. Uh, and then also we need to understand uh, what happens afterwards. Uh, 
uh, once the care proceedings have finished uh, and we've all walked away, what happens to the young people? Uh, and there again, um, some of the voices there uh, were, were very telling. So although this may not be news that we've seen today, it is very, very valuable to see it collected together and laid out in sequence, uh, albeit snapshots, but very clear snapshots so that we can see what we're doing. The evening that's been presented is a wake-up call, I think, for all of us uh, as to just what is going on and how we can look to find out more uh, and improve our practice. More research is, I think, essential. We've um, tantalizingly seen uh, glimpses into uh, each of these areas and there's a real need to drill down further. Uh, of course, uh, I have no control over these matters, but I would have thought um, that the FJO would be well advised to see if there was an appetite for uh, MPs and uh, uh, government officials to see this uh, presentation. It is very accessible uh, and clear, uh, and it shows what we're doing in the family justice system. We show It shows how gritty and difficult it is Sally Jenkins' contribution from Newport um, and the way she described it just shows, A, how important it is for these young people who fall between crime, mental health uh, and care uh, and how tricky it is to find out what to do. Um, uh, it is, I hope, the beginning of yet further work by the, end, uh, the, 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 the Family Justice Observatory to uh, lead us on by shining a light on all these areas. So I'm very, very pleased that they've done this work and I'm pleased to be able to play this small part in it this evening. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Sir Andrew, for joining us this evening. I'm now very pleased to introduce our discussion panel. Her Honour Judge Hilary Watson, DFJ for Coventry in Warwickshire, who you saw earlier. Uh, Mr Justice Keane, Family Division Liaison Judge. Sally Ann Jenkins, uh, who you saw earlier, Head of Children and Young People Services at Newport City Council, and Sarah Parsons, Principal Social Worker at CAFCAS. Now, we're going to uh, try and address some of your uh, comments and questions in this last 15 minutes of the webinar. Um, so carry on putting your uh, questions in the Q&A tab. Um, but if the panel is able to uh, see and hear me, I wanted to start really with uh, asking Hilary Watson to tell us a bit more about the work that you've been doing in Coventry and Warwickshire. I could see from the reaction in the chat that people were very interested in the work that you've been doing to give young people more of a voice and a sense of agency over the decisions that be are being made. What would be your message really to other judges and magistrates about how to take this work forward? Well, we call it the adolescent project. Uh, we, yes, we've used the uh, FDAC model. So it's, um, it's, um, uh, it's using that problem solving approach. Uh, what I would say is that you would be amazed at what services and support are out there for young people. So the, the first thing you need to do is have a forum of uh, services, uh, what's on offer from education, from health, uh, from um, uh, the local authorities in terms of the, the support services. You're, you've then got all the tools that you, that you need as a judge and the social workers need. And when you then um, meet with these young people, and there is, no, there is no way around it, we just have to speak directly to these young people. We heard three um, young people who are perfectly able to speak and speak their mind and to art articulate their concerns. Well, why shouldn't they speak directly to the judge or to, or to the magistrate who's uh, deciding their cases? Um, the problem with it is that as a judge, you're also going to have to decide the issues in the case. So that there is a need to keep a, always in your mind the difference between hearing evidence and um, inviting the young person in to share a bit of their life, to tell, uh, tell you a little bit about them. Uh, and it's, um, it's that, that's why we had the my plan, as I, as I described it to you, which asks those, those questions which move it on from the proceedings 
to things that would make a difference in their life. And that's where the problem solving comes in. With the help of the social worker, knowing that there's all the services out there, it is possible to actually make some small differences that have a huge impact on these young Thank people. Thank you. So I, I know that you've been working closely with CAFCAS on that project. I wonder if I could bring Sarah Parsons in. I mean, to what extent is this something that CAFCAS is working on in, in other parts of the country in terms of really bringing forward young people's voice in this way? Thank you. Uh, yes, it's an absolute priority for us. Um, the, the key vehicle we've got to uh, take all that uh, associated work forward is our, our practice framework, which we're calling together. Um, this is a, 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 an approach to um, working on relationships, really. I mean, really, the, the messages from the young people that we heard today were so, so powerful as they often are in terms of um, uh, you know, the, just the idea of uh, of the young people we work with don't know anything about us but we know everything about them and one of the keys sort of the, 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 sort of the I suppose one of the slogans of our framework is about um, uh, connect before content um, so the idea of um, whatever limited time we have with children and young people we, we absolutely need to kind of find ways to um, uh, understand their unique experience and um, uh, find ways to communicate um, that helps them to feel that we have dealt sensitively with their information and that there's no stone unturned in um, in doing that and um, and really just simple things like um, sharing them are sharing with young people our recommendations um, that we that we're going to be um, uh, putting to the court and letting them know at the end of um, our uh, involvement with them what's happened and um, so really sort of simple things but um, would make such a huge difference if we we're able to do those consistently i mean there are there is good practice absolutely there is already uh, but we need to make that more consistent and and and, uh, and act on uh, what our young people tell us thank you sarah um the other key issue that came out of, on that last last section and a lot of people in the chat commenting about the fact that we know a lot about the impact of trauma and the need for trauma informed practice. Um, but why haven't we been acting on that evidence? I wonder if I could bring Sally Ann Jenkins in because you described some of the challenges of working together across services and, and bringing services together. What do we need to do to to, to make that happen? Um, I, I absolutely agree. The frustration that we've not been able to do this today is immense. I mean, I, I absolutely feel that. Why can't we do this? Why haven't we done this sooner? Um, and it is frustrating. And it and and sometimes that that palpable sense of please can why can't the system bring these elements together? Um, I mean, certainly what we found locally in our experience is that, and it, it is to, to it, there is no credit in this to any of our professions that we still sit in the silos and that we are unable to bring the pieces together. In, in a way that really works for children and young people and particularly for older young people. Um, and when I look at the arena that we're trying to pull together in Windmill Farm with particularly child and adolescent mental health services and education, um, it is like banging heads together. Um, I think we have to keep going and we have to keep trying. Um, I think as Sarah just said, we've seen some examples of where there is good practice and we need to really keep trying to do that for the sake of the three young people who've spoken together and all the hundreds and hundreds that we work with. Um, I do think it's possible, but I think it takes a real determination and commitment to keep going and keep going at it. And I think things like this research and perhaps further research in this area really helps in giving some of those messages and demonstrating. I think, for example, the, the, um, of the five points, the one about education and exclusion, hugely important in terms of really consistently emphasizing that message about the damaging impact of exclusion on children and young people and um, recently heard a phrase that exclusion is is a failure of the provision and i think there's something about some of us as professionals accepting that these are our failures and we need to own them and make a difference and what would be your um your request of judges and magistrates in in this process what do you need from the um, courts to help with that I mean, in some ways, I think very often that the um, highlighting that um, judges have made of the placement inadequacy is useful um, because it helps us to then be able to drive with both local authority and um, 
Welsh Government in our case and Westminster into looking at how we resource and how we can better source placements. So I, I, difficult as it is, my plea would almost be to request the judges to keep doing that because that does help um, and it assists us in being able to then add weight to the arguments that we put at government level and indeed in our own local authorities in terms of resourcing um, and ensuring that there is a focus on um, the inadequacy and the failures of the system in this area. So I think that would be a really clear one. Um, I think it was interesting the observation from I think it was Joe and Celia in relation to um, that there's less breakdown in kinship placements. So I think there's something about asking the judiciary and magistrates to work with us in terms of how do we ensure that family group conferencing is properly implemented with families um, when they are as part of this process and then how do we support kinship um, arrangements and sometimes holding our feet to the fire to make sure that we get that support right for kinship arrangements. So I think that's probably two out of a starter. Thank you Sally. I wondered if I could ask Mr Justice Keane about whether this is an issue that um, the Public Law Working Group is, is looking at. Um, it is and um, in fact just before I came onto this meeting uh, I w had a meeting with Josh McAllister because we meet fairly regularly he obviously is chairing the care review and um, it's incredibly important that um, the message that has come out of this evening and when it was came to us from the Public Law Working Group is the agencies working together uh, and uh, young people being able to access all those agencies, not just the local authority, but mental health um, in, in particular. And one agency working alone isn't simply going to be able to provide the answers. Uh, we've seen with a number of cases principally from Alistair MacDonald, but I've done some recently, and as Sally was saying about announcing the difficulties and, and making it public, um, they are hugely under-resourced. And local authorities spend a vast amount of time trying to find the appropriate placement for young, troubled and vulnerable young people. And more often than not, sadly, they're ending up in suboptimal placements which are doing them no good at all, and in fact are exacerbating the harm that they suffer. And I've had a number of cases of 15 and 16 year olds who need secure, who can't find it, and the most awful difficulties they get into and the risks they present to themselves and others present to them is huge. And all of that would be solved if we had sufficient, suitable, secure and residential placements where they could receive the help that they so desperately need across a broad range of issues. Thank you so much. And um, yeah, really underlying the need for joint working on this. I think given the, the, the comments in the chat and the Q&A um, earlier today, which is really about wanting to move forward and take action, I wonder if I could put a final question to the panel before we wrap up. And if you could answer as, as briefly as possible, but what's one key action or message that you want to take away from what you've heard today? Um, perhaps I could start with uh, uh, Judge Watson. Hilary, I think you're on mute. Thank you, Mike. Um, I, we've got to listen to these young people. They're telling us how to do it. I, I just don't think we can ignore it. And they, they're saying they, they want to be involved. They want to speak to, to, to people and have their voice heard. Thank you. Sarah? Yeah, I have to echo uh, that too. It's, it doesn't cost anything. To, it doesn't take even, even any longer sometimes to um, connect and talk to a young person in a way that um, really allows them to feel that they've, uh, their experience has been understood. Um, so yeah, I would just have to repeat that. Great, thank you. Sally Ann. Um, I'd absolutely echo that. I think without listening to young people, it's, we might as well give up now in some senses, but I would really want to echo the five points that Joe and Celia made, because I think across those five, is probably a way forward for us. And although it's frustrating feeling that, um, as Strandry said, it's not rocket science, I think we have to keep coming back to that and underpinning that with the voice of the young person. Thank you. And Mike? Um, I, well, I endorse all of that uh, entirely. And I, the, the value of 
speaking to young people is huge. And I certainly find it, as I think Hillary does, hugely rewarding. Rewarding for me as a judge, but it's rewarding for the young people as well. But I think the other thing to highlight, and this comes out of the Born Into Care research as well, is getting all the agencies to work together. And we're only going to be able to um, provide better and more effective help from the youngest to the oldest in our care system if everybody is working together. And battling against hospital trusts or CAMs um, just simply isn't helpful. And it certainly isn't helpful to the young people. Thank you so much. I'm sorry that's um, all we have time for. I did promise we would finish on time. But I want to thank you all for attending today's event and particular thanks to our, to our panel, to our presenters, our contributors, and to Sir Andrew McFarlane and everyone else who took part in our various films. If you'd like to download the research, please go to our website, nuffieldfjo.org.uk. This is very much a first step in an ongoing project to inform change in the way the family justice system responds to older children and young people. Uh, so to be kept informed of upcoming research, please sign up to our regular bulletins at nuffieldfjo.org.uk forward slash subscribe. We would be really grateful if you would fill in our event feedback form and we look forward to welcoming you to future webinars on behalf of the Judicial College and the Nuffield Family Justice Observatory. <laughs>